Kia ora, no Engineering New Zealand Young Engineers Committee Aho, Co Emily Collings Aho, Kia ora. So a very warm welcome to everyone who's joined us live for today's webinar on fish passage management in New Zealand. This webinar has been arranged and organised by the Department of Conservation and Engineering New Zealand. This week is Conservation Week. It runs through till Sunday, the 11th of September. And this year's um, Conservation Week theme is all about taking action for nature. Taking action for nature not only benefits our personal well-being, but also that of the environment and animals around us. So um, there's a saying, ka ora ti whenua, ka ora ti tangata, and that means when the land is well, the people are well. So please feel free to check out the Department of Conservation website about ways you can get involved and take action for nature. Our webinar will also cover this. Um, today we're fortunate enough to have four active members of the New Zealand Fish Passage Advisory Group with us. Um, Tanya Blakely from Bofa Miskil and Eugene Vodonsky from BBO uh, will be presenting um, to us an overview of the fish passage requirements and how to provide and help improvement of this in New Zealand. And then following their presentation, we'll have some time for questions. During this time, um, we will also be joined by Department of Conservation's Technical Advisor for Freshwater, San, Sean Bowie, and also Minister, Ministry for the Environment, Alex Rain, who's an analyst. Um, we hope that you all learn something from today's webinar and um, that you're able to implement this in your work and help take that action for nature. So I will pass over to our fish passage experts. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Hello, everyone. Um, so as Emily uh, introduced, we're going to talk today about fish passage management in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, and so Eugene and myself are presenting. Uh, we're both members of the Fish Passage Advisory Group um, and so bringing to you today a, a bit of a summary of Fish Passage. <clears throat> so really, um, I think at the crux of it, um, I'm an ecologist and so I always get pretty excited um, and interested in, in why Fish Passage is important from an ecological perspective. Um, so Aotearoa New Zealand, we, we've got more than 50 species of native freshwater fishes and several sports fish. Um, and the habitat requirements for these uh, fish species is really varied. Um, there's factors such as water velocity and depth, substrate size um, and complexity. So things like large boulders um, and rivers versus spring-fed cobbly streams, um, in-stream cover, undercut banks and boulders, large wood and log jams, etc., uh, are really important um, in supporting the species that are found in waterways. <clears throat> Some species, for example, like bluegill bullies or redfin bullies and torrent fish, they tend to like really fast flowing riffle habitats. And then there are other species that have different habitat preferences. And this is really important when we're thinking about um, the, the makeup of our freshwater fish communities in New Zealand. It's, it's really interesting because the freshwater fish fauna is unique in, in New Zealand with an unusually high proportion of diadromous species. So that means that they have to migrate between freshwater and marine environments to complete their life cycles. Actually, about a third of our freshwater fishes are diadromous. But more importantly to consider as well, or also important to consider, is that our non-migratory species meaning those species that don't actually need to go to the sea to complete their life cycles, they spend the whole of their lives in freshwater habitats, they still need to move between habitats and within freshwater bodies. <clears throat> I think we all probably know and are hearing a lot about the, the peril of our freshwaters um, and our native species. Um, it's um, are really under pressure from habitat modification and um, other things, uh, and in fact, of the native species that are known in New Zealand, more than 70% of these are ranked as threatened with or at risk of extinction. 
When we think about fish passage, <clears throat> we talked about migratory fish species just before, um, and also the non-migratory species that need to move within a catchment or within a stream. <clears throat> we also need to think about the, the freshwater invertebrates or the macro invertebrates. So this is the, the insects, the snails, the worms that live on the stream bed and they make up basically the food web, the, the, the food for the fish species and, and birds and things in the terrestrial environment as well. Like fish, um, macro invertebrates have um, quite um, unique or um, specific habitat requirements, um, like in using cobbles that are clear of algae and fine sediments and things. Um, and um, some of our migratory, some of our freshwater invertebrates are actually migratory as well. So for example, freshwater shrimp, it's a very coastal species. Um, some others are not migratory in the same way as freshwater fishes are. But we've got a couple of really interesting species like kakahi, so down there in the bottom right, the freshwater mussel. Um, it has a really unusual reproductive uh, and dispersal strategy. So larvae are dispersed out of the, the female mussel's siphon and they latch onto the gills of um, native fish and they stay there and that's actually part of their dispersal strategy to then drop off uh, and, and find a suitable habitat in a stream. Um, so this is a really important consideration as well when we're thinking about things like fish passage. So it really is about the whole of the ecosystem. Freshwater invertebrates, just like freshwater fishes, unfortunately, uh, about 26% of those that we uh, know of to the species level are threatened with or at risk of extinction. <clears throat> so ecological connectivity really matters. The distance inland from the sea and the elevation of the waterway are uh, important factors on whether diadromous species occur within a waterway. So it's very much depends on a species climbing ability. Some species like giant kōkapu and inanga, they tend to be occurring in lowland uh, rivers and streams and wetlands, whereas mm -hmm. kawaro and eels, um, and sometimes, and to a lesser extent, banded kōkapu, they can climb somewhat or navigate up natural barriers and, um, and uh, such as waterfalls um, and be found further up in the catchment. So this diagram here just, I think, is a really good way to really understand the importance of ecological connectivity. <coughs> so we've got um, species like um, the, the white baits, um, uh, a juvenile stage of our five migratory galaxids, uh, and they um, spawn in freshwater habitats, uh, and they hatch, and the juveniles head out to sea and spend a bit of time in, fresh, in the marine environment, and then come back in and grow and reproduce in freshwaters. Eels, on the other hand, so we've got two species of eel, um, <clears throat> and they spawn in deep water trenches in the South Pacific Ocean. And then the glass eels, the really teeny tiny juveniles, they return to freshwater um, and the individuals slowly make their way up the streams and rivers as they grow. And, and I always find it interesting because eels are extremely long lived and they spend many, many decades in freshwater habitats. So the whole catchment is important um, from a habitat and connectivity perspective. So some species spend most of their lives um, in lower or coastal reaches. Um, and other species uh, move up their, um, their way up into uh, the headwaters. Human activities can create barriers and reduce ecological connectivity and habitat availability along a catchment. Things like in-stream works can have an effect on uh, fish passage. Flood banks and flood gates and stock banks can actually sever the connection, so make it um, difficult or sometimes impossible to reach those um, other tributaries in a catchment. Stream creations and diversions, raceways, drains and ponds, and water intakes, and of course dams as well. So all of these are important uh, when considering ecological connectivity and fish passage. So freshwater fishes, they vary in their climbing abilities. <clears throat> so some species, like eels and some galaxids are able to climb near vertical wet uh, rock faces, but other species um, are, are considered poorer climbers and restricted to lowland and coastal waterways. Because of these diadromous species um, and the fact that they need to migrate um, and to and from the sea, um, 
and they have varying climbing abilities. It's, they're particularly vulnerable to natural and human-made barriers, things like chutes and dams, uh, weirs and culverts. So when we talk about fresh, our freshwater fishes, we can largely group them into four um, swimming abilities. So there's the swimmers, um, so species like inanga, smelt, grey mullet and common bullies. They usually swim around obstacles. They rely on areas of low water velocity to rest and um, they can use intermittent burst type anaerobic movements to get past high water velocity areas. Then there's the anguilliforms. So this is our short fin and long fin eels, the two eel species in New Zealand. Um, these fish are able to worm or wriggle their way through small spaces in between stones or vegetation. Eels um, are also able to breathe atmospheric oxygen if their skin remains damp. Uh, and then there's the climbers. Uh, so that's lamprey, um, juvenile eels or elvers. Uh, in juvenile stages of some of our um, migratory galaxids that make up the white bait species. Um, they're able to climb the wetted margins of waterfalls and rapids and spillways. They somewhat stick to the substrate using surface tension <clears throat> and they can have roughened or sucker-like um, fins or even the lamprey, which is a pretty interesting species, <clears throat> has got a sucking, uh, like, <clears throat> excuse me, a sucking mouth part. And then the last group is the jumpers. These species are able to leap using the waves at waterfalls and rapids. And as the <clears throat> um, water velocity increases, it becomes energy saving for these fish to jump over the obstacles. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I've got a couple of videos just to show some of these differences across some of our species. So we'll just push play on this. Um, so this is um, a video showing, uh, so there's no audio, um, so don't be concerned if you can't hear anything. <clears throat> this is a video showing two, the differences between two of our um, uh, migratory galaxids. So uh, Inanga is up first. So remembering it's um, one of the swimming species. And it's trying to navigate this, um, uh, water take uh, structure in a river. <clears throat> you can see there just um, in the centre of the image, you can see that Inanga is using its burst swimming technique, trying to swim um, up this vertical obstacle through um, the, the flow there. Uh, use my mouse. And then <clears throat> we look at the other species, Banda Kokopo. So remembering as juveniles, particularly, they can somewhat adhere to surfaces and use their wetted margins and wriggle their way up. So they've popped out of the main flow um, and managing to climb up this. But then at the top of the structure, there's a, um, a horizontal lip that they are unable to get across or over. Here's another example of Bender Kokopo, just showing their ability to climb those wetted margins. So out of the flow of the water, just using the wetted margins and surface tension to wriggle up. And this really does um, vary also, or can vary um, on body size and, and or, due, or life stage as well. So as they get bigger and heavier, it becomes more difficult. And last one is Inanga. <clears throat> so this is uh, showing um, the way Inanga use that burst swimming and they pop in behind, so at the beginning of the video there, they pop in behind um, these rocks um, that provide um, a, a variety of flows and they take a little rest and then have another little burst swim, so we'll just watch that again really quickly. Seeing at the beginning, you can see them navigate much more easily as they've got obstacles and rocks to pop in between and take a rest, and then it becomes very difficult, um, much more tiring uh, to make it through um, this sort of area where there's no break in the water velocity. It's very, very fast. So 
So Eugene, in a minute, will talk to us more about the water velocities and engineering and things. Before we move on to that, we'll just quickly look at the legislative requirements. <clears throat> so there are a number, um, or there are numerous pieces of legislation relating to fish passage in New Zealand. Uh, DOC and regional councils have specific responsibilities to manage fish passage under um, the Freshwater Fisheries Regulations, the Resource Management Act, and the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management, and the National Environmental Standards for Freshwater. So let's look at each of these for a moment. So DOC is responsible for enforcing the Freshwater Fisheries Regulations from 1983. <clears throat> This is under part six of these regulations. It gives DOC responsibilities that apply to all natural rivers, streams, or other freshwater bodies, including to ensure that culverts and fords are not built in such a way that they impede fish passage. And culverts and fords are maintained to prevent the development of fish passage barriers. <clears throat> and that uh, dam or diversion structures may require a fish facility to be included. The really important thing to remember with the freshwater fisheries regulations is that they came into force on the 1st of January 1984. So the regulations apply to all structures built after this date, but there is an exception because there's an additional clause that has the requirement for culverts and fords to be maintained to prevent the development of fish passage barriers. It's really important to remember that this applies to all culverts and fords built before and after 1984. The second main piece of legislation is the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management, <clears throat> which came into effect in September, on 3rd of September 2020. It's the main source of national direction for how, how regional councils should manage freshwater. It requires freshwaters to be managed in a way that gives effect to Tamana or Te Wai. <clears throat> and then NPS FM is implemented through the regional planning framework. And it's, so it's the responsibility of the regional councils. <clears throat> section, uh, there's a particular section, section 3.26 of the NPS FM, which provides direction on the requirements for fish passage. And every council is required to include the following fish passage objective in its regional plan. The passage of fish is maintained or is improved by in-stream structures, except where it is desirable to prevent the passage of some fish species in order to protect desired fish species their life stages or their habitats. Every regional council is also um, now tasked with preparing action plans to support the achievement of this fish passage objective. <clears throat> and the fish passage action plans must include um, a bunch of things, um, including identifying existing in-stream structures in the region, evaluating the risks of these, prioritizing for the remediation of existing structures and identifying the ongoing performance. And we'll talk some more about that a bit later uh, because it's quite relevant to how we deal with existing uh, barriers in our waterways. Hmm. Uh, and, and also finally, the um, National Environmental Standards for Freshwater. So this falls within the um, Resource Management Act, um, again, it's implemented by regional councils. Again, it came into effect on the 3rd of September, 2020. And part three, um, subpart three, sets the standards to manage effects on fish passage. So essentially it's, it's like rules. The purpose of these is to deal with um, the effects on the passage of fish of the placement of new structures. So culverts, weirs, flat gates, dams or fords. The NESF, includes permitted activity rules or design criteria, I suppose, for culverts and weirs, um, with the inf and also some information requirements that need to be collected within 20 working days of installing new structures. There's also requirements for certain conditions to be imposed um, that the regional council would need to impose on any structures that require resource consent, so they aren't able to be designed or um, aren't designed to meet the, the criteria for a permitted activity standard. Um, and also for any uh, ongoing monitoring and maintenance requires, requirements. So what is a barrier to fish passage? Hand over to you, Eugene. Okay, well, first we'll go through the obvious. There are some very common structural barriers 
Um, this one culvert with an apron, this is pretty much a series of structural barriers. First, you've got the culvert shape. Um, it's pretty much as far from ideal for fish passage as you can get. In fact, it's an inverted version of what would normally be used for wastewater conveyance to maintain the highest velocities possible. Um, so yeah, no retrofit opportunities there. Um, then you can see immediately downstream, we have a step in the concrete apron. The concrete apron itself is very concrete, smooth, uniform velocity, um, fairly shallow flow. That in itself is not is enough of a um, barrier. And then you look, oh, well, you've got the step that they built in. You can see it down in the lower photo as well. You can see the step. Then we come down and we find out, oh, there's a drop into a pool down below. Um, that drop is actually not was not originally designed in that it used to meet the bed, but as is often the case with um, culverts, we ended up with a huge scour hole at the bottom. Basically, we're losing bed material, causing a large scour hole, which head cuts into the culvert can literally undercut the culvert, eventually creating an overhanging outlet. So, um, it also causes erosion around the unprotected bed and banks. Let's see, why don't we go on ahead to the next slide? There we go. So another, another example of an elevated culvert with a um, rough riprap apron down below it. So what do you have? Of course, you have a round culvert with no embedment you're gonna have a very hard time getting fish passage through that without some kind of weir or something to back water through the culvert. Um, then you have the drop from the culvert. It's also overhanging. It's perched well above the um, receiving waters. And it's the riprap itself doesn't really afford good passage. So, um, Let's go on over here. And again, I'm not sure what happened with this culvert, but we have uniform uncontro uncontrolled flow in the culvert going to a vertical drop. Now the culvert itself might be fish passable here, but it's definitely not gonna be permitted activity material. There's no embedment in it. And with a drop right afterwards, you'd have a horrible time keeping embedment inside the culvert. So there's no shallow margin. Um, you've got highly turbulent flow. It's pretty much your swimmers aren't gonna make it. Your jumpers are gonna have a hard time. Your climbers, maybe. So pretty effective fish barrier. Let's go to the next one. So we talked about scour downstream and head cutting. Here's a pretty good example in the uh, we ended up replacing this entire gully on the uh, picture to the upper left. And that's more than a two meter drop from the wing wall sticking out. That's all just um, scour and head cutting because flow velocities coming out of the undersized culvert just pretty much ate everything away. And once it started, there was nothing to stop it. Also the downstream um, channel was too steep for to be stable under the um, developed flow conditions that are coming from upstream. So the important thing to remember when you're looking at these culverts and you're trying to diagnose what the issue is, especially if you're gonna try and retrofit, is, is it a stream problem or is it a culvert problem or is it both? In this case, it was both, but the stream problem was definitely the biggest one. That is an absolute fish barrier. Nothing's gonna get past that. It overhangs, it's very high, and yeah, in very high velocities in the pipe. The next one, we had a very pristine stream upstream and downstream of this other box culvert. The box culvert was probably fish passable in normal flows, but just downstream, there's a big old drop. And I believe that one was actually built in from being there because the substrate seemed to be quite stable in the channel while in a gully, the channel itself was not in size. So um, another fairly effective fish barrier. So we can go to the next slide. 
Okay, some more rather obvious ones here. Um, flap gates. Flap gates have a myriad, well, numerous issues, including fish passage. They it's just obvious you've got high velocities around the edges that are gonna be hard for fish to manage. They often close at the wrong times for fish migration, high turbulence. Then the other uh, photo is basically showing a flow measurement weir with a drop behind it. So if they do manage to make it up to the flow measurement weir, they still have shallow high velocity flows to get through. So again, um, yeah, and I see the notes mention tidal variability. Um, it's not always tidal. If you have a river or a stream that has um, reservoirs upstream, you can have massive variation in the river levels that you have to deal with. For instance, do a lot of work on the Waikato River around Hamilton. The operating levels vary by four meters, according to the um, consents. So they can vary the level of that river up to four meters and be within their consent. Designing an outfall or a, into a, something like that can be a very big challenge and you've got to make sure you don't get it too low or too high. So we can go on to the next one. And again, another fish barrier. Um, this is a major stream running through in an urban area. They needed to get increase the capacity of the stream and prevent erosion, so they lined it. This was done back in the 70s before we really cared about this stuff very much. But now this about a half a kilometer of the stream is largely uh, not fish passable. The wetted margins are extremely minimal around the edge because of the shape. And the velocities are fairly uniform through the whole um, cross section. We'll get into velocity distributions shortly. But so pretty much this is between this and that first culvert that I showed you that was the waste inverted wastewater culvert with the strange apron. This stream is pretty much sterile for most of its catchment because both of those items, both this bit of um, um, lining and the half kilometer of lining and that earlier um, culvert and apron are quite literally right at the near the outfall to the Waikato River. So that's it's pretty much slowly depleting any fish life out of the catchment that's migratory. So we can go to the next one. Okay, and back to you then for a bit, Tanya. Uh, yeah, so we'll, thanks you, James. So we'll talk about how we can afford, um, avoid fish uh, barriers in design. So firstly, just, um, I think let's just recap on uh, the requirements or the legislation for new structures. Um, so remembering we've got those pieces of legislation, so the National Environmental Standards for Freshwater uh, and the Freshwater Fisheries Regulations. Um, so new structures um, need to consider these and, and meet these requirements um, to ensure that uh, any of these new structures provide for fish passage from the start. And so design requirements for culverts and weirs are provided to uh, allow for the installation of these uh, without a resource consent. Um, so the, uh, essentially a permitted activity, but remembering that that, that provides for the ability to uh, um, design or, or build this device, but then there's still potentially other resource consents that would be required to actually undertake the installation of the structure. So, for example, if you needed to, um, likely needed to uh, divert um, or temporarily um, take the system offline in order to build that, there would be some potentially some resource consents that were required there. Um, so, the National Environmental Standard provides these uh, design criteria for culverts and weirs. Other structures need a resource consent. Oops. Um, and I guess in, in summary, um, the, so it really is regulations 70 and 72 for culverts and weirs. And basically it boils down to a few things. 
Um, so this is not verbatim necessarily, um, but it's just in a summary, um, the structure must provide for the same passage um, of fish upstream and downstream as would without the structure. So that's really important. Um, culverts need to um, have the same slope uh, be inverted, uh, have the invert buried um, more than 25% below the bed, contain natural stream bed substrates, and be approximately 1.3 times the width of the river or the connected area. That 1.3 differs depending on the width of the stream, um, but that's a, a, a rough kind of number there. Um, where's, for example, the, the fall of height needs to be no more than 0.5 metres, uh, the slope no steeper than 130, uh, and the face must include roughness elements and variety of flow velocities. And of course, don't, don't forget that culverts and fords um, shouldn't impede fish passage without the um, approval under the Freshwater Fisheries Regulations of 1983. And new dams and weirs um, would likely need an assessment uh, and require a fish facility. So that's administered um, or regulated by the Department of Conservation. With the um, National Environmental Standard for Freshwater, Regulation 62 also um, requires a bunch of information to be collected with all new structures being installed. So the placement, alteration, extension or reconstruction of structures. This has to be done within 20 working days of putting the structure in. Um, and that includes these things that are bullet pointed here for you. <clears throat> Um, this is quite a, um, a great place to, um, I guess, bring your attention to the Fish Passage Assessment Tool, which was developed by NIWA and is um, endorsed by the Ministry of the Environment. So this is a, um, a readily available app that um, is used for assessing and collecting information on fish passage and um, structures in our waterways. And actually it captures all of the information that is required by the National Environmental Standards for Freshwater. So check that out um, if you want to find out some more and you're not familiar with the uh, FPAT, the Fish Passage Assessment Tool. And I think we can put the link uh, to that in the chat window as well for you. And also um, there are a, a number of monitoring requirements. <clears throat> so all new structures that have a resource consent, so they, have, they haven't been designed to meet the permitted activity standards. So therefore they require resource consent from the regional council um, the Regional Council will then need to also include some conditions around ensuring um, monitoring and maintenance of those structures for the life of the structure is sufficient to provide fish passage. That's a really important consideration, I think, when it comes to designing um, new structures, because I think it actually has some quite potentially quite big cost implications as well, considering that the, the life of these structures can be um, quite a long time and that monitoring and maintenance would be required for the duration. Uh, and I guess lastly before handing back to Eugene to talk um, more about the engineering specifics, um, if you haven't had a look at it before then certainly check out the New Zealand Fish Passage Guidelines um, which you can find on the interweb um, and, and this is a great source of information um, for all things for structures up to four mm -hmm. metres. Really the, the, the nuts and bolts or the gist of it is if you design and build it right from the start, um, then I think meeting fish passage is achievable. But Eugene, over to you. So basically what we're trying to do is we're allow the, trying to allow the fish someplace where they can navigate through a higher velocity culvert. So we have to understand flow distribution within the channel and the culvert we're dealing with. So this is an example of some flow distribution. Um, oh, I don't know. Let's just call them illustrations from my old open channel book, Chow. And you can see all of these numbers, 0 0.5, 1.0, 1.5, et cetera, are all multiplied by times your mean velocity because everything you do you, use, you apply Manning's equation or anything like that, you're gonna get a mean velocity. So you have to understand how you're not, you're often not going to achieve fish passage with the mean velocity. In fact, that would probably cause some uh, 
geomorphologic issues or sed bed load and sediment transport issues if you tried to get the mean velocity to be fish passable, because that's not even the case in the natural stream in many cases. So you can see that certain shapes are more conducive to fish passage than others. A round culvert, well, there's a pretty thin layer of boundary water where the fish might be able to get through. So, and the velocities get high pretty quick in a round culvert. A round channel, once again, you can see, but you might get a little bit up in the upper corners. Um, box culverts. You often have a nice little low velocity area in the corners, and you can utilize that with some very carefully placed baffles if you need to, although that can cause some issues. So there's good information on fish passage in box culverts in a number of places, including um, there's one that's fairly recent hydraulic engineering guidelines to assist upstream passage of small bodied fish species. It's standard box culverts. Um, it's basically out of the University of Queens, Queensland in Australia, but it's very useful. It basically shows fish using the area along the edges of box culverts and up high and down low in the lower corners. So it gives you a pretty good idea. So, but really we need some way of estimating what these velocities are. So let's go to the next slide. So you can actually find the, you can get a good estimate of the reduced velocities as a mean velocity in narrow vertical strips inside your cross section. And if you use a, um, well, there's an old FHWA report, not that old, but that um, is referenced here that shows a methodology that reference or that methodology is also built into a free program put out by the federal US Federal Highway Administration for culvert design. So that methodology is built right into HY8. That's that program. It, HY8 is also very good for determining the stability of embedment inside your culvert to make sure you've got it in a place where you can keep the embedment. So you know, you're going to try and maintain a minimum of 150 mils along the edges or the, and um, that has a velocity that's fish passable, meaning if the fish can maintain that burst speed long enough to get to the other end of the culvert. Let's go to the next slide. So to get fish velocity, um, we're still using a table from uh, swimming velocities versus duration for New Zealand native fish species. We were warned against that for a while, but even though the methods for coming up with the velocities weren't very good, it looks like more current testing is finding that they aren't incorrect. So this table is extremely helpful when you're trying to come up with a range of velocities versus you know, burst speeds over time so that you can get enough endurance for the fish to burst all the way from one end of the culvert to the other, or from one hidey, hidey hole or resting point to the next. So we won't go into this in great detail. It's covered pretty well. The use of this and the approach are covered pretty well in the fish passage guidelines. Let's go to the next slide. So yeah, what about bed load and sediment transport? Not just fish passage is important. We've got to keep culverts so that they, the embedment is stable, doesn't accumulate, doesn't erode away, which means you have to also balance the bed load and sediment transport across the culvert. Um, you can often do this by maintaining the same mean velocity in the culvert as the native's natural stream around it, as long as your depths aren't too deep. Um, and by achieving this, fortunately, it's it's usually, you do this for the um, channel forming discharge, which in small weightable channels is generally um, the bank full discharge. And this is also the typical migration flow for um, migrating a New Zealand fish species, which is quite convenient. Also, uh, 
you can you can't always estimate this flow. This flow can be kind of challenging to come up with, especially if you're in an unstable stream. Um, if it's highly incised, you can't you're not going to find a bank full discharge. If it's lined or somehow modified, you're not going to find a bank full discharge. So what you can use, it's been shown that for small streams like you'll usually use a culvert for one half of the two year ARI works just fine. So let's go on to the next slide. So, so just examples, single barrel culvert. Um, it pretty much spans the entire bed of the channel, which is good. You don't see any acceleration or deceleration of the flow as it passes through in a normal flow condition. You might get a little acceleration in a um, bank full situation, but it shouldn't be too bad. So let's go to the next one, box culverts. Um, box culverts are interesting. If you get to a multi-cell box culvert, you start to get into some issues where you can have too shallow a flow and also your bed load and sediment transport is going to be interrupted. So you end up depressing one of the boxes and sizing that to handle your channel form and discharge in a manner that balances bed load and sediment transport and allows fish passage through. Um, the photo of this large box culvert below, this was before the fish passage guidelines, but what we did with this culvert is we set it up similar to the design up above and we set it up so that it balanced the bed load and sediment transport by maintaining the same velocity in the natural channel during the bank full discharge. It took some calculations to come up with that, but it worked out pretty well. So this thing has been through many different flows, major floods, and it's holding up quite well. If you go to the next slide, you can see that when you look, the bed extends right through the culvert. Now we didn't actually put embedment in here because that would have been a bit of a challenge for the contractor in this case. And we were far enough down the catchment that the sediment was gonna make it there regardless. So it, within two weeks of the culvert going live, the uh, channel bed had filled the aprons and also filled the bottom of the culvert. We have about 150 mil, mils of sediment in there. It is supporting macroinvertebrates and fish. Unfortunately, we don't have any um, monitoring now I mentioned the aprons, culvert aprons up and downstream are crucial to getting fish passage through. You get accelerations around the edges of the culvert that can be, you know, that need to be managed by the design of the apron. So that's something to keep in mind, but that's a little more detail than we're really, than we have time for today. So um, there hasn't been any monitoring on that culvert to date, which is kind of sad, but you can observe fish in it. If you're doing a multi-barrel round culvert, this is an example we're applying. And where we are reestablishing a stream where it had been taken out by um, agricultural practices. Again, we size the, cul the main culvert with embedment so that it, it conveys the channel forming discharge in a manner that is both will balance set of bed load and sediment transport and allow fish passage. The other one does not flow in the channel forming discharge, only flows beyond that. And it's important that you have the overflow culvert for things beyond that, otherwise your velocities get too high and you'll start losing your embedment. So, yep. So stabilizing incised channels, sometimes in order to avoid situate your culverts being elevated, unintentionally, you end up stabilizing in size channels. Usually this is going to involve drop structures. Um, this was a rather aggressive treatment because, well, that very first um, incised channel with the two plus meter culvert drop, we were replacing that entire little stretch of gully. In order to do that, we had to come up with a detailed drop structure made with grouted boulders and natural substrate inside those boulders. They manage the energy, they keep velocities, high velocity areas short, and there's a resting point at the top and the bottom. The bottom of the culvert also 
or the bottom of these drop structures also has to have a stilling basin. Not only does it provide a resting area, that stops the hydraulic jump from crawling on downstream. So we can go on to the next one. This is what that stream is looking like now. It's right next to Hamilton Gardens. It's doing pretty well. It looks like a natural habitat. And now that the wetland vegetation is pretty much filled in all around the boulders and through what we used in there with soil riprap, not just ordinary riprap, we now have wetland vegetation throughout the area. You don't see rocks everywhere, only right at the drops themselves. And um, yep. So just, I had to throw this in because we don't always put rocks in stream. So we try to avoid it as much as possible. This is about a kilometer. This is a picture from a stream that we had to relocate for another client. The, um, it's an engineered stream. You can see we've used woody debris, we've done bay, we've added in bend apex pools, and the whole thing was designed so we had one, in the entire half kilometer, we had one half meter drop that needed some riprap, and the rest is simply done in soils. And that's through shaping the channel appropriately and the floodplain so appropriately. The one little drop structure just created a um, small riffle. So. So existing barriers. Um, so thanks you, James. So just um, finishing up, we'll just uh, touch on this really quickly um, so that we leave plenty of time for questions. Um, so we talked about existing structures uh, and the, the legislation around the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management and also the Freshwater Fisheries Regulations um, requiring um, the, the need for those to be um, identified um, and evaluating the risk of these to fish passage and prioritizing the remediation uh, for these to ensure ongoing um, and improved fish passage in New Zealand. <clears throat> so dealing with existing barriers, um, if you want to find out some more, you can have a look at the fish passage uh, guidelines, um, but just to uh, briefly summarize these, um, there's essentially a hierarchy um, of options with removal um, being what should always be the first option um, and it will always have the best result so removing a barrier uh, where that can't be removed then considering replacement of that with a with a friendlier design a fish friendlier design um, or, or also further down the list retrofitting thus um, but it's essential to ensure that the, the method used to retrofit is fit for purpose it's also important to remember um, that um, built barriers um, need to be retained or, or possibly built to protect our biodiversity. Um, so won't go into too much detail on that, but there are certainly some cases where there's a need to protect some of our um, highly threatened species um, from um, some of our exotic species like uh, trout and salmon uh, and also potentially some of the native species um, where they're um, under quite a lot of threat. Um, so just to show you an example here um, and you can see many more of these examples on the Department of Conservation Fish Passage page. This is an example of remo removal and replacement. Um, so removal of a, a, a ford can see it's um, on the left hand side there creating um, quite, a, quite a substantial barrier to fish passage um, and this was replaced with a bridge. <clears throat> and in the guidelines you'll find this handy table um, which gives a, a pretty good summary um, and then you can drill down a bit further in the guideline in the information in the guidelines about the kind of problem that you might be facing um, with some existing structures. So is it excessive fall height? Are there high water velocities um, inside a structure or, or around a structure? Um, maybe there's insufficient water depth or um, there might be a physical blockage like a flap gate. Um, so check out some of the solutions there that could be applied. And lastly, for more information, um, you can visit these pages. So there's a, a heap of information on the Ministry for the Environment's Fish Passage page, um, and also the Department of Conservation Fish Passage page. And that's where the New Zealand Fish Passage Advisory Group keeps um, a bunch of lessons learned um, and videos uh, and a whole lot of resources. So dig into those if, um, if you want to find out some more. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya and Eugene. That was really, really insightful.
Uh, thanks for sharing. We've got a few questions which have been asked um, while you've been speaking. Um, I'll, I'll just choose some at random. Um, so we have a question here from Tony, which says, do catchments repopulate once long-term fish barriers are removed? That's a good question. Um, and certainly that, that is the intention of um, removing or um, rehabilitating retrofitting um, barriers. Um, so um, I guess so long as there are no other barriers downstream that might be impeding, then, then absolutely that ought to be the case. Um, there are other considerations around um, habitat suitability uh, within the area that you're looking at as well. Thank you. Um, so, do wetlands play a role in fish migration? Sorry, I missed that question, Emily. Um, do wetlands play a role in fish migration? <laughs> um, I might lean on uh, Sean here to speak to that as well, um, but the answer is, is yes. Um, but maybe maybe limited for some species. It depends on the amount of water and habitat that's available in the muspose and where they are in the catchment as well. Yeah, just to add to that, um, wetlands definitely play a role from the perspective of whether they're fish hab habitat or not. So it depends on the location and the type of the wetland. Um, but generally they are just like anything else. They're a type of waterway. Um, and if a fish needs to move through it to access habitat upstream, um, wetlands have amazing populations of giant kokapu, longfin eel and those sort of things. Um, and just on that previous question, sometimes um, fish that are, that are impeded downstream, they are moving upstream into new catchment areas within days or even hours after it has been remediated. So um, there's been some really cool examples um, of some weirs and structures being removed where fish have moved up into the catchment for the first time in 20 plus years. So, yeah. That's great, that's, that's so good. Um, we have a, another question probably for Eugene. What is your recommendation for when a weir is needed within a stream? Uh, generally speaking, you're going to be trying to reduce your, um, your hydraulic grade. Um, if you've got water that's moving too fast and you're trying to basically um, reduce the hydraulic grade by putting little step wears along the way. That would be the one place I would probably use a weir. And in that case, it would probably be configured more like a rock ramp. And there's actually a, um, a good, I believe it's a USGS um, publication on rock ramp design and guidelines that gives some very helpful information on that. So just to kind of get steps, keep the velocity between the weirs reduced for bed stabilization and stream stabilization in general. That's when I would use a weir. I try to avoid them. Okay, thanks Eugene. Um, question from Jot, why does internal width of the culvert have to be wider than the existing bed? Should I take this one? Yes. Um, so generally speaking, the flow in culverts moves much faster. So if you leave the culvert the same width, you're going to find that the velocity is actually increased. Uh, the 1.3 is kind of an average number. Um, it doesn't necessarily work. I've had to design culverts that are slightly wider. Um, the big box culvert example I showed you was probably about 1.2 times the width. So um, I think the important thing to remember, two important things to remember, you've got to keep the velocity similar to the stream to maintain habitat connectivity. And you don't wanna create some kind of challenge for the fish, you're trying to make it function fairly naturally. And the other thing to remember is you're not always gonna get a permitted activity. So, um, if you get, if you go one point, if you're trying to hit the permitted activity rules, you can, but if you wanna go through the calculations and you have to get a consent anyway, I would highly encourage going through the calculations and getting the fish right. It's a free program, so it's not that hard to use, so. 
Thank you. Um, this might be another one for you, Eugene, sorry. Um, in long, steep culverts, embedding culverts only provides permanent water near the outlet and providing maintaining natural stream bed would be difficult due to high velocities. What is your thinking for long, steep culverts? Oh, I try to avoid them. Your chances of getting them fish passable is not good. Um, the longer it is, the farther away from the uh, potential endurance of the fish you get. So it's just never going to make it. Um, I've tried to design some retrofits for long, steep, round culverts. It's very difficult. If it's too steep, you're right. You're just not going to get it. So you should. And there's no reason why any engineer should be designing long, steep culverts. There's ways around it. You'll have to modify the channel to provide passage to and from the culvert possibly and then get it down to where you can get some fish passable velocities. Um, there's some opportunities sometimes for baffles if you aren't too long and steep, but baffles are a very mixed bag. They work for some fish that are worse for others. And um, I'm not gonna go in much detail on that because there's studies going on right now and I don't, I'm not sure. I just know that you have to use them with caution. Okay, thank you. Um, question here from Jack. Jack says, um, ancient engineering has used concepts of holistic designs for nature, not just humans. And now we can see these, this type of engineering is re-emerging. Do you think lost natural environment can be regained to some extent? What are the alternatives for natural rock boulders? And um, thanks for sharing great knowledge. An alternative for natural rock. Um, the first, the benefits to rock and riprap are that it's flexible. So you've got some room for error. If your velocities are low enough, you can actually, plants are fine. We don't use rock everywhere. We try to avoid it. And when we do use rock, we use it in locate, specific locations. We can find the high velocities to those locations. So that's, that's step one. And then if you're trying to manage high velocities with some kind of material, um, it's, no, I don't know. Um, you could try some of the, um, geotextiles or geo meshes that are available, but they have to be permanent and they're, they're still limited in the type of velocity they can handle. Uh, they're, they're good around the edges, but yeah, you know, I'm not, I haven't found a lot of options that are readily available and, and truly tested. Okay, and um, we have a couple of questions also about um, fish bypass structures. Would these be a useful generic solution? Um, to a cul in a culvert? Or um, they didn't say, did they? Um, no. Well, the fish bypass is going to have to have the same velocities that the fish, that the, um, culvert would have had to have or whatever you're putting it the fish bypass around so it's possible but you should definitely talk to a good fish or aquatic biologist that knows fish behavior well um, because it can be complicated they are going to follow the primary flow is my understanding and not necessarily run off on some small flow that's jutting into the side of the channel um, I ran into that one once when talking to um, Bruno David with Waikato Regional Council, who's their aquatic biologist. So yes, it is, but it's complicated, not simple, and in some cases, absolutely necessary. But it's, it's, a, it's a significant design exercise with a lot of biologist input. Understood, thank you. Um, we have another question about what are the measures of success for these um, fish passage structures? 
um, so uh, <clears throat> I think a good place to, to go to find out about some of um, that sort of information would be the fish passage guidelines. Um, there's a, a, um, some great information in there around the monitoring uh, methods that can be used for determining um, success. Uh, and so that really is around the communities um, that are uh, present um, and understanding what that fish community was like prior to uh, retrofitting, for example, and remediating a barrier. Um, so the before and after monitoring is, is super important to have a bit of a uh, to have a good understanding of whether there has been an improvement that has been made, um, and it includes, um, I, I guess, the need to understand um, different uh, size. Uh, age classes or size classes of fish. So are the juveniles returning? Um, is it only adults there? Um, the different species, those, those kinds of things. So yeah, I'd absolutely recommend going and having a look at the, um, the, the guidelines for some more information on that. Great, thank you. Um, just to confirm the NES freshwater culvert embedment requirements apply to both box and round culverts. The embedment requirements apply to box and round culverts. I don't know if you want to comment on that, Alex, at all from a ministry yeah. perspective. Yep. In general, I'd say yes, but I'd say when, when you're getting your culvert consented, I'd seek advice from your local regional council. I guess the, um, the, the intention uh, in part about embedding the structure is, is obviously to um, retain um, and have substrate, core substrate within that, which provides, um, you know, um, variety of velocities and things like that. So it's all of an important component of um, providing for fish passage. Thank you. Um, we'll start wrapping up now, but there's another um, good question here. Would culverts with periodic flow be managed differently? For example, the culvert is dry 95% of the time. I doubt there's a lot of fish habitat upstream of the culvert. And we're just catching occasional drainage. Um, Tanya, do you have anything to add to that? Probably the I mean, only thing I'd add, to Eugene, is that um, I think it would first um, be important to understand why the culvert is um, only flowing periodically. So is it something to do with the way this, the structure has been installed that's meant that um, flow only goes through it um, and possibly goes under it? You know, certainly you can see that. Um, and so it might appear to be dry and not provide any surface flow apart from at higher flow events, um, possibly because of the way it's been installed or, or the way things um, have oh. eroded and changed through time. So as long as it isn't an ephemeral or a very occasionally flowing system, and it's towards the top of the catch, uh, catchment, then it may not have fish habitat. Sometimes it's just periodic drainage that goes through. And I don't believe the fish passage guidelines apply if there's no fish habitat around. Is that correct? Um, another question here relates to um, lighting in culverts. Um, if your box culvert can provide fish passage but is 300 metres long, what about lighting in the culvert? Um. That's a bit of a, that's an interesting question. So there's a um, um, still some research that needs to be undertaken in that, I think. Um, but it is certainly plausible that um, there's, there's evidence to suggest that the, a darkness effect um, could create a, a barrier to fish passage as well. So potentially longer culverts um, could be an issue. I think the other thing to consider with length of culvert um, is that um, very long culverts quite likely also have very homogeneous flow and a lack of habitat within them as, as well. So just that, that physical change can also be a barrier as well. It's probably a little bit hard to disentangle that sometimes. 
Yeah, one other thing we came up with long culverts when working with um, the biologist in um, Bay of Plenty is you basically tend to lose your macro invertebrate population in there. So it isn't, it's not a complete habitat anymore. It's just soil in the bottom of culvert if you've even got embedment for that length. Your bed load and sediment transport's gone once you get that long. Every, it changes the rules completely. So lighting may just be a part of it. Okay, thank you. Um, speakers, do you see any additional questions that you would like to or have time to answer? We'd like to wrap up in the next five minutes or so. Um, ben and everyone uh, listening live, we will be sending a link of the recorded webinar. So you will get that in the Engineering New Zealand uh, newsletter. Any other questions um, to answer, Tanya, Eugene, Sean, or Alex? I think they're probably the only other thing to mention, Emily, is I think Ben Nadette is going to um, send around some, some additional links um, that people can take a look at. Um, one of those links um, includes um, a question and answer uh, fact sheet from the Ministry, which includes some details um, that many people have asked around the National Environmental Standards for Freshwater um, and getting some clarification on some of those things. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, some, some um, videos um, of some of the uh, removal uh, projects that have been carried out in New Zealand. So really cool stuff to look up and, and have a, a view on if you um, have a look at if you're interested in finding out some more. Thank you. It's great to know that there's some good case studies out there. Um, OK, well, we'll draw it to a close. Um, there's some email addresses that have been um, shared. So people would like additional information about the fish passages. Um, as Tanya nicely rounded up there, there's a lot of um, resources available to help with this design and management. So um, yeah, we wish you all uh, happy, happy fish. <laughs>